On this vote, the yeas are 228, the nays are 206. Article 1 is adopted. Bill Clinton becomes the first elected president ever impeached by vote of the full House of Representatives. That moment was exactly 20 years ago today. The U.S. House impeaching a president for only the second time in history, a process that was linked to the kind of investigation that can haunt any White House, a special or independent counsel. In fact, there are only roughly three people alive who've held that kind of role, Bob Mueller, Patrick Fitzgerald, and my next guest, former independent counsel Ken Starr, who investigated Bill Clinton. Uh, thanks for coming on The Beat tonight. My pleasure. Let's start with, and the book, of course, I want to mention, Contempt, a Memoir of the Clinton Investigation. And we're going to get into some of that tonight. Uh, but let's start with this news on, on Mike Flynn. Uh, what went wrong for him in court? I think the judge was offended by what he read. So that's obvious. He said as much. But he also said something that I think has been emphasized. You committed crimes on the White House property. Mm -hmm. You were in the White House. And you were also a very high-ranking official. I think those two things, coupled with what he read in the, the redacted form, but he seemed to be very upset. I mean, some of this is inference, to be honest, but I think he was really offended by the representation of Turkey and the way that representation must have been characterized in uh, the 302s, the FBI interview forms. Now, here is something I find very fascinating. It was a bad day, above all, for General Flynn, but it was also a very bad day for Bob Mueller. This was a deal. It's a deal that prosecutors work very hard for with their witnesses. 19 interview sessions. That's a lot that Mueller and his team had with General Flynn. And apparently, the general was full forthcoming. He was not lying. There was no mendacity. So all seemed to be smooth sailing. And when you have a deal, the prosecutor has a deal, and the judge says, not necessarily. Maybe we don't have a deal at all that I'm going to approve. When, that's, that's a real issue for the prosecutor. And when the judge said that Flynn arguably sold out his country, do you oh. agree with that? I don't know what's in the 302s, but based I will on say... Based on what's public? Based on what's public, I can't say that. I would not reach that judgment. But I'm not, I'm not going to gain, say, uh, Judge Sullivan, whom I know and greatly respect. He f there's no question. Even judges can fly off the handle. He used the T word, treason, and he walked that back. And I think as soon as he returned to chambers and he thought well of it, better of it, he said, I've gone too far. So I admire him for saying, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really upset, but I should But you're saying it's not said, nothing when Judge Sullivan tells a defendant who's already confessed that he sold out his country. I, I want to ask you about... He hates... Judge, th that judge hates governmental official wrongdoing. Right. That kind of abuse of power is what we're talking about. How do you compare, Ken, the difference that Flynn was getting from Mueller and Cohen from the New York prosecutors uh, to people roughly broadly cooperating uh, and Cohen getting a much harsher sentencing recommendation. Well, I don't think that, uh, first of all, the Southern District of New York, as you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office just has a different culture. Mueller's goal is to get to the bottom of things as quickly as possible. He wants to vindicate the rule of law, but he wants to answer these very vexing questions about collusion and perhaps other relationships. As I see it, all right, there's no evidence of collusion with respect to the campaign. We're now finding out more about business relationships. So there seems to be a lot of connection, but it hasn't translated yet into collusion with the campaign. You're referring, though, to the new evidence that maybe the collusion was not with the Trump campaign, but with the Trump organization a letter of intent with Moscow that they were hiding. Uh, can that be an element of conspiracy? It, it could be, but I don't think that has to do with, as far as I know, with the presidential campaign. I think it's sort of two different tracks. Here is the business relationship track. Here is the political track. Well, let me give you the legal theory, and, sure. and you're, you're quite a prosecutor, so we'll get your analysis. The way that those tracks combine is that the head of the Trump campaign is also the head of the Trump organization, and Michael Cohen... Uh, has now provided information that they were actively pursuing money uh, linked to the Russian government for a business deal while someone was ahead of both those institutions. Look, we have strains of information. My view is pursue it, and I think that's what Bob Mueller is doing. Uh, I have said from the very outset, Bob Mueller is a person of complete integrity. 
I've raised questions about some of the people around him, but I've also joined a number of voices on the Republican side of the aisle and said, let the man do his job. Let him do his job. So let's go into a couple of, of quick yes or no questions, and then we'll get back to Clinton history. I can't qualify? This is just yes or no? <laughs> Hopefully, <Yeah. laughs> unless, unless you object, Counselor. Uh, you mentioned that Mueller should be allowed to do his job. Right. If a president, I'm talking any president, uh, seeks to fire a special counsel. Is that a potential element of obstruction? Potential, but not likely, because he would be exercising his authority just as Richard Nixon did with respect to Archibald Cox. And at the time, no one suggested that Richard Nixon had committed an obstruction of justice by directing the fire. Well, the court ruled actually Ralph Nader filed litigation, and in Nader v. Bort, they, they litigated that whole issue and got some positive precedent that it might have been an unlawful it, firing. It, it may have been, but I do not think that in the fullness of time, given what has happened since then, namely the Supreme Court of the United States speaking unanimously unanimously about obstruction of justice. No, I don't see the elements that the Supreme Court has You commanded. operated under different law, but could Bill Clinton have fired you? Uh, no, he could not have fired me directly under the statute, because I was appointed under a statute. Bob Mueller, as you know, is an officer so of the you're, Justice So you're Department. saying, bottom line, you were stronger than Mueller, not because you work out more, but because your underlying law was stronger. <laughs> I, look, he's a Marine, uh, so he, he, he beats me in any number of respects. But the law provided special protections for independent counsel. Right. Now, back to the obstruction, yes or no. What about firing an FBI director to interfere with a probe? Could that be an element of obstruction? I don't think so, because he's exercising his power. He can so that's say, a no. What about, no. I just want to get you on this, what about ordering the criminal prosecution of an FBI, of a former FBI director? I think that's coming closer, but I still would say no. He's still exercising his power as... What about requesting... Impeached. Sure. What about the re requesting the prosecution of journalists? Could that be obstruction, something that you would be impeached I don't impeached think that's over? obstruction at all. I think that's impeachable. What about discourage... That when I say obstruction, I mean something that the Congress about a president might find to be obstructive and impeach oh, over. Oh, yeah, because Congress is not limited to these very technical sure. elements, as you well know, with respect to what constitutes obstruction of justice. So those things you think Congress could impeach a president over if they found it a pattern of obstruction? Congress has plenary power under the Constitution, as I see it. Uh, it can say, this is simply taken as a whole the course of conduct constitutes an abuse of power. Abuse of power. What about discouraging witnesses from cooperating with law enforcement? Once again, that could be an actual crime. Discouraging witnesses could, in fact, constitute intimidation of witnesses. What about when a, if a president says that the people who are cooperating with law enforcement are rats? Freedom of speech, unwise, uh, uncalled for, uh, just extraordinarily unseemly, not a crime. Not a crime. Not a crime. I think Part, this, is it is it again let, let, go back to your impeachment analysis. Is it the kind of thing that coupled with other interference could be impeachable? If you take non-criminal acts and put them all together, it doesn't constitute a criminal act, in my judgment. I think so. We, as oh, you know, because oh, let, let me you're a, one thing. Go ahead, about, finish. Let me see one, one thing. We overcriminalize things in this country, and I think Congress is now finally responding to the idea that we go too far with the criminal laws. But every, think, every viewer and every listener knows everything we just discussed altogether has been done by the sitting president. Does that, in your view, as obstruction, as perjury, potentially, uh, oh, make, where's make the perjury? a, make wait, a wait, case? Wait, wait. wait, where's the perjury? Well, on his behalf. Oh, wait, on his behalf. And then Michael Cohen confessed to it. Uh, uh, listen, That's his lawyer. Different people will could. That's one of the things my book is about. Different people did different things sure. to assist President Clinton in his crimes. And he was guilty of crimes and found guilty of crimes, specifically the crime of obstruction of justice. Well, we'll get to Clinton, but I want okay. to stay bl briefly right. on this. Okay. Did that, does that pattern make a case of impeachment for obstruction, in your view, or no? Oh, for impeachment, again. All right, I want to draw a line sure. between what Congress could say, this is conduct that we don't accept, as opposed to here's a criminal offense. It doesn't, in my judgment, need to rise to the level of a technical crime under obstruction. So if of you were advising this Congress or you were in Congress and you're a public official, you have a lot of experience, would you say these things together could make a, a valid case for impeachment? Uncertain yet. You would need to assess literally all the evidence. And that's one of the things that the independent counsel statute of all required. Let's see all this evidence and then we'll come to a judgment. Let's look now as we look back and 20 year anniversary is a, a night to do it of you discussing some of this regarding the case uh, for impeachment based on obstructive acts. Let's take a look. 
we concluded that perjury and obstruction of justice, like bribery, may constitute grounds for an impeachment. Are you in a position now where people will question whether you're applying a different standard to this president, who happens to be in your party, uh, and the president you investigated, who happened to be in the other party? No, because it began uh, with actual perjury, uh, and we believe intimidation of witnesses in a judicial proceeding. So that's another aspect of this. What the president had to face, what President Clinton had to face, was a civil action, a civil rights action, mm -hmm. and he had to then be honest. He could settle the case, which he should have done, or then he had to conduct himself lawfully, and he did not. And I don't think anyone seriously disputes that he not only committed perjury, he encouraged others to lie. And then here was the crescendo, the, what we reached, and this was with the complete agreement of the legendary at the time, Sam Dash, now departed, who was in the Watergate uh, episode as a special counsel to uh, Senator Sam Irvin. And all this led up to abuse of power. Abuse of power, but as you say, in a judicial proceeding, uh, you know Donald Trump has, has lied about his personal life. Oh, there's no question. About no question. That. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't bother you unless it happens in court. Oh, of course. In terms of bothering, citizen versus public official and uh, impeachment. One of the messages is, and you'll get there, is impeachment is hell. We lived through that as a country 20 years ago. And so I think you're requires, saying you put us through hell. I'm saying the House of Representatives took the evidence and said we have a duty. To do what we well, you, feel like that's what you to had do. them do. I mean, you wrote a report for them do, to impeach. I gave them that. All right, this is great. All right, this I is gave, great. It is. Ken all Starr right. on live TV saying that you didn't give them information to lead to impeachment. No, you uh, you had a very different characterization of the question. So roll it back, roll the transcript back, and now I will answer the question. I got to tell you, I feel like asked. I'm talking to a lawyer. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Well, so am I. So what the statute, and this is one of the defects in the statute, and it's no longer a defect that Bob Mueller has to live with, is that the statute set the bar very low for providing information that may constitute grounds for impeachment. That's what the Congress required the independent counsel to do. So the report that went up was precisely that which Congress in 1978 said, that's what we want. Ari, the good news is for the country, we don't have that regime anymore. You're Bob saying, Mueller. and I'm characterizing, but you're saying the good news is we'll never have another Ken Starr investigation. <laughs> we will have no, for, uh, well, you could also ask Judge Walsh and so forth. So I, I prefer Wait, that you I'm not asking you. I prefer that you not personalize it and make it more structural because the statute created, well, there were about 20 independent counsels uh, over the course of that 21 years. But yours was the one at your tenure that led to that impeachment that you're calling hell, that you're right. Obviously, the underlying law was strong, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so it put that information, but you wrote that report. Let's also get to something very interesting that you know is hot today. You solicited an opinion uh, for your investigation that argued a sitting president could be indicted. Did you agree with that view then? Yes. Do you agree with that view now? Yes. So you think that if there is the right evidence, Bob Mueller or another prosecutor could indict a sitting president, Donald Trump? Yes. May I now expand? Yes, sir. Yes, but the Justice Department has a different view, and as you know, has had a different view uh, for almost half a century, going back to a brief filed by then Solicitor General Robert Bork, uh, th then Office of Legal Counsel, formal opinions, including during the Clinton administration. It was a very impressive uh, legal documents with very thorough analysis. I just happen to disagree with them, and you, if you say, well, What why? is the argument for? Yeah. Clinton versus Jones. President Clinton said in the civil setting, not criminal, I should be immune from a civil lawsuit during the course of my uh, tenure as president. And the Supreme Court unanimously said, no, Mr. President, there's no basis in our rule of law, constitutional order, for you to enjoy temp just temporary. He said, just give me a timeout. And they said, no. Well, 
the public interest in the enforcement of the criminal laws, I believe, is even higher, as important as civil litigation is to the individual litigant and to the rule of law. Uh, the vindication of the criminal laws is all the more important. And so it follows... Even more important to the government, you're saying, to the, to the country. Because then it's the United States versus Mary Rowe or John Doe, as opposed to Paula Corbin Jones versus William Jefferson Clinton. Let's look at uh, some of the back and forth when you were testifying, because something that Bob Mueller does differently than you is he doesn't talk out right. of court and his people don't leak. Mm. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah. Mr. Charles Backley, your, your uh, press spokesman and public relations advisor, uh, has been on, by my count, uh, 10 uh, talk shows and is on Nightline tonight. But it, does that sound about right, that he's been on 11 talk shows? That probably sounds about uh, right, but I would have to do the count. Was your more public strategy better than Mueller's, or is he right to be so discreet on this probe? It's a judgment call. I really don't think it's right or wrong, but I had a vision What's of the public. better course? I think the better course is greater public information than we have been having. Uh, but that's Bob Mueller's determination, and I have the greatest respect for that determination as well as for him as a person. Here's my view. Power carries with it accountability. You must be responsible for your exercise of power. And so we did feel in the investigation, it was not my view alone, but it was my responsibility to come to a judgment, that we should provide public information to the extent that we possibly could, consistent with the constraints of law, the confidentiality of the investigation, and also grand jury secrecy. Now, we were accused of leaking grand jury information. It was bogus. It was utterly well, you're, bogus. You had, a, you had a staff member who was indicted and then acquitted over that. There was a charge and he was acquitted, but more importantly, the entire investigation was acquitted, so to speak, by virtue of a special master investigation, a, a wonderful judge, very respected judge in the District of Columbia Circuit, who was appointed by the chief judge. Right. With I want regard, you to look into all this. Well, I have looked into it, believe it or no, not. No, I said we, we all, want, you yeah. were asked to look into it, I understand. That's the grand jury material, which is the most super secret. Right. Then there's other stuff that, as you know, the legal term is not double super secret. Um, and you did do a lot of leaking about that. I mean, your office leaked a lot of stories. Do you think you leaked too many stories? I disagree that we leaked stories, but... Well, let me, okay. let me disagree with your disagreement and give you All a right. chance to respond, Mr. Good. Starr. Uh, there are reports from that time, and you've got a book all about this, which folks can check out for your view. They say, quote, prosecutors painted a different picture. Sources in Starr's office, quote, tell us. Sources right. near Starr, prosecutors suggest... Aren't right. those uh, attributions to your office? Yes, but uh, this is not the, uh, here's the, here's the distinction. Public information that's appropriate to provide to the public. That's the key. Did we leak that which was not supposed to be provided to the public? And my view is no, we didn't. Understood. And I didn't say which Mueller doesn't no, no. do. No, look, you're just characterizing it. Oh, so let me, let me, let me rephrase, because we're, we're having a lawyer to lawyer here. Yeah. Let me rephrase. Your office spoke about non-grand jury material to reporters that is for correct. attribution and on background for stories in a way that Mueller's office does not. That is, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. And, and, the, and so I, the, to and get I, back into the meat of this, what do you think of the Mueller strategy on all these sensitive matters where they're doing none of that? You did a lot of that, and, and your office, as I think it's fair to say, some people disagreed with that. No, I agree. It becomes a judgment call. But my traditions were the Justice Department, where we had a public information office, where we would hold press conferences, where we would try to make available, Ari, to the public through the reporting process that information which we felt was appropriate, especially because the Clinton White House was masterful at, quote, leaking and planting absolutely spurious information. So you felt you were responding to your, Frequently. your target? Frequently. Let me, let me read you something Justice Kavanaugh said in the, in the little bit of time we have left. He worked for you in that investigation. Yes, he did. You've praised him as an attorney. Yes, I did. And his record uh, as an attorney and a judge is, is embraced by the Federalist Society and other groups. Uh, during his, his confirmation, he said, that the effort during his confirmation was, quote, a calculated and orchestrated political hit with anger about President Trump. He said it was, quote, revenge on behalf of the Clintons, millions of dollars of money from outside left-wing opposition groups, end quote. Uh, as a legal matter, 
Does he have to recuse from some litigation about those people he attacked during that hearing? I think it's going to be a serious question. Uh, but you look again at all the facts, exactly what did he say, and then who are the parties and what are the issues in dispute. It's a holistic kind of judgment, totality of the circumstances. And well, there's will groups have... with litigation. I mean, I just to yeah. your point, there's four cases before the Supreme Court in this next term from some of those groups, including the ACLU, which spent the money on ads against him that he was referring to. Mm -hmm. I think he went farther, I think you would agree, than most sitting judges do in, that, in those remarks. Uh, you're saying there is grounds for recusal? No, I'm saying that it's an issue that knowing Brett Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, with his record, leave aside the unpleasantness mm -hmm. of what, what happened. Look at his magnificent record, an unblemished record of public service in the public eye in Washington, D.C., not in North Dakota, but in the glare of publicity of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and universally respected and admired. I think he will act with integrity. And, and that could include recusal, is what I'm it, trying to oh, get. Oh, absolutely. Clearly. It'll be his judgment. You referred to my characterization earlier. I would like to characterize you uh, as generous with your time, and I appreciate you coming <laughs> on the beat to have these discussions, sir. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sorry. Ken Starr, former independent counsel. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.